Today, we're gonna to look at tales of two countries. We're gonna look at places, real places. The first of those countries is France. Now, my goal here today with these two countries is not to tell the whole history of the country, and it's certainly not to give all the art history, but here's what I have in mind that we look at the kind of picture we get of that country through their art, and that the kind of picture that the citizens get of their own country through their art. Well, I think in talking about France, we might begin with the Marseillaise. Allons enfants de la patrie. That is a very bloody battle cry. Arise, children of the fatherland. The day of glory has arrived against us. Tyrannies, bloody flag is raised. Do you hear in the countryside the roar of these savage soldiers? They're coming into our midst to cut the throats of your sons and countrymen. To arms, citizens, form your battalions. March, march, let their impure blood water our furrows. The Marseillaise was started, you can see in the uh, middle of the French Revolution, there wasn't just one revolution, there were several revolutions between having a line of kings and becoming a republic. But this is when there were countries that were coming into France, coming to Paris, trying to come to Paris to help preserve the royalty, the crown, and so this is what it was taught, the people from Marseillaise, from Marseille, they were marching toward the capital. And so that's why it's called the Marseillaise. So the first painter we're going to look at is one that we looked at last week. The uh, cursor is on Madame Recamier, the portrait that uh, David did last week. I think it was just sort of like left there, I'm not sure, but um, this was a neoclassic portrait, her reclining, sweet, looking at us, neoclassic, calm. Let's look at David's most famous painting from the French Revolution. It's called The Death of Marat. And you will see on the left the painting. The middle paint, the middle picture seems to have grown in size a little bit. So you'll have to look at the details on the left of the actual painting. What do you see? You see blood. You see some details. Where is that man? Who is that man? Who is Marat? Let's look at a video about this painting to learn more about the details. We're in Brussels looking at one of Jacques-Louis David's revolutionary canvases. This is The Death of Marat. Revolutionary in two senses. Revolutionary in that it was painted during the French Revolution, which started in 1789. France was made a republic in 1792, and David here commemorates a hero of the revolution. But it's also revolutionary in that it's depicting a contemporary event. Before this, David had painted scenes from classical antiquity. Early on in the revolution, David had joined the Jacobin Club. This was a group of the most violent and radical revolutionaries, and David himself became quite close with the leader of the Jacobins, Robespierre. David voted for the beheading of King Louis XVI. His signature is on documents created for the arrest and execution of members of the aristocracy, of people who were against the revolution. So David was really in the thick of it. He served in the revolutionary government. He helped to dissolve the Royal Academy of the Arts, and he was essentially the minister of propaganda, spreading the ideals of the revolution through images. And that's what this is. The revolutionary government 
government asked him to produce a series of three images that would heroicize new martyrs, not a Christian martyr, but now a martyr to the revolution. This shift from Christian martyr to political martyr is an important one. We have the beginnings of the end of the world of the monarchy, of the Ancien Regime, of an absolutist ruler, and the beginnings of a new republic, the beginnings of a world where the people participate in the government. The French Revolution had been inspired, at least in part, by the American Revolution just a few years earlier. But France would oscillate between Republican and Royalist governments over the next century. A Royalist named Charlotte Corday, a woman who believed in the monarchy of absolutist rule, went to see Marat, the leader of the revolution, and by tricking him, murdered him in his bathtub. You can see the knife which she used to stab him lying on the bottom left corner of the canvas, and the letter that she used to gain entrance being held by Marat. He was a publisher, so his role in the revolution was important because he helped to disseminate revolutionary ideas and to rally the people. He holds this letter that she used to get in to see him. David is showing, look at how duplicitous this woman was. She tricked Marat, he was innocent, he was good, he was working for the Republic, for the French Revolution, and she came in and brutally stabbed him. There is this extreme contrast between her duplicity and his nobility. He's ideally beautiful. We know that he was disfigured by the skin disease that caused him to spend many hours of each day in the bath, but you have no sign of that here. And his pose reminds us of the Pietà, of the image of Christ being mourned, having just been taken down from the cross. So the idea that a martyr to the revolution is replacing the central Christian martyr is vividly rendered. That was a key idea of the revolution, to dismantle not only the monarchy, but the church as well, and to secularize French life. And we see that also in the creation of a new calendar for the revolution. And below the signature, David has written year two. So we're not in 1793, we're in year two of the revolution. So this whole replacing of the old world with a new revolutionary order for a new French Republic. The idea of rationalism was being violently instituted. Instead of the older traditional measurements, for example, this is when we first have the more rational metric system being introduced. This is the Enlightenment. This is a time of rational thinking of believing in empirical observation over the superstitions and traditions of the church. And this is a painting that is all about observation. This is really interesting contrast between the specificity of the foreground, especially the crate on which he's written his name and written a Marat, to Marat, against the indeterminate open brushwork of the background that almost doesn't look finished. It's got this soft, feathery, warm quality It isolates Marat, it focuses our attention on him. But as we look around at other paintings in this museum, what I see in the upper part of a painting are angels, and David can't have that anymore, and a new iconography has not yet developed. So instead what we have is a lighter field in the upper right corner, balancing Marat's body in the lower left corner. And what a body, the anatomy, the muscles in the shoulder and the arms and the collarbone. We can see that neoclassical interest in studying the anatomy, painting it very carefully, paying a lot of attention to contours, modeling and the effects of light and dark. But what strikes me is the spareness in direct contrast to the luxurious interiors of Rococo paintings, of the lifestyle of the aristocracy, which was the subject of Rococo paintings. Here, a decidedly stark interior, Spartan, no elaborate furniture, no gold. This is a man, David wants to tell us, lived according to the Republican ideals of the revolution. And it looks like they will endure forever, but soon the revolutionary will turn against each other. And David is imprisoned for his involvement in the revolution and then becomes first painter to Napoleon, who becomes the emperor of France. And so a lot of art historians look at David's career and say, where were his actual principles? Where were his loyalties? Did he truly believe in the ideals of the revolution and then become a follower of Napoleon and 
abandon those values? Or was he politically mercenary? Was he really looking for commissions from whoever was in control at that moment? It's hard to look at the death of Marat and not see a man who was convinced of the importance of revolutionary ideals. There are a couple of main things other than just the artistic nature of that incredible work. One of them is the elicitation of emotion. I wonder if you thought you got during the video the fact that it's really kind of like a propaganda piece. I mean, he was commissioned to show some of the martyrs of the revolution to promote the revolution. And so he is eliciting emotion here. In the video, they compared it to the Pieta, to the lamenting of the Madonna over her crucified son. Look at the position of the limp body. Also to Caravaggio's entombment of Christ on the right. And then I'm showing down below a photograph that was done in 1971 by Eugene Smith. It's called Tomoko and Her Mother in the Bath. It's a picture of a woman bathing her very deformed daughter, who's a, an adult, because it is a, what we can call it propaganda, we can call it uh, just promoting the fact that she was severely diseased by the water system in their town. So Eugene Smith purposely elicited the emotion in the same way that the Pieta is done. He posed it that way. Well, here's some other versions. Here's a portrait on the left of Charlotte Corday, and it was painted at her request a few hours before her execution. Yes, she was executed for her role in the murder of Mara. Look at the middle one, an entirely different point of view. The um, drama here is not eliciting so much the, the sadness, the emotion, but more of the drama, the light on her face. I mean, she's a murderer the toppled chair. We see him in his bath, but he's not the real subject here. And then on the right, our old friend Klimt, who did the scream, he has his own version. So it's really, I think, interesting, the kinds of emotions, the kind of effects that these different works can have on us over the same subject. Well, as it was pointed out in the, in the video, David was sort of a switch hitter. I mean, they, they went from having a king and getting rid of a king to getting an emperor. Not only did they get an emperor, but they got an emperor who crowned himself when it was time for the Pope to crown him. This scene, Napoleon crowned himself, he's not really doing it, although I'm told that you can see the original drawing in the background. I can't see it here of him taking the, the crown, I mean, taking the crown from the Pope and crowning himself. Here he's crowning his wife, Josephine. And the Pope, who is dressed in white on the far right there, is just sitting, twiddling his thumbs. Now, part of his hands are going to, you know, give his blessing. It's okay, Napoleon. Napoleon, dressed in the robes of a Roman emperor, wearing that same type of a crown. Here's another picture that Davi did of Napoleon. Now, on the right, you can see one that is supposed to be truer to facts that, that Napoleon might have crossed the Alps along with his troops on a mule, but look at what David did. Now, David now has switched from neoclassical to totally romantic. I mean, look at that rearing horse. The matching of the mane and the, and the uh, tail, which matches the drapery, Napoleon, look, and matches the clouds and the rocks. 
all of that swishing upward movement. I mean, this is your emperor. If he's even written his, his name down there on the rocks and a little bit of Hannibal, who is supposed to have crossed the, the Alps in Roman history. Well, the drama of drapery. We talked about it before and how painters make something more dramatic by having a drape that drapery that's pulled back to give a more dramatic effect. The very first painting that I showed in this class was the creation of Adam by God on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And I showed it not only because it's magnificent, but because it had something to do with the theory of this class, which is that there is a spark that's created when those two fingers meet between God and Adam. And I talked about how the spark of a work of art is created when there is contact between that work and the viewer. But also I learned when studying this piece that there are some scholars who say that God isn't really creating Adam so much as giving him consciousness and that that drapery is really an outline of the human brain. Take it or leave it, kind of fun. If you look at this painting, you will know that you've seen it before. Do you remember when? Yeah, it was when I showed you the photograph of the artist who did the Obama portrait. He has taken that image from David and created it with an African-American in the place of Napoleon. Here it is on the left. Above Bonaparte, down on the rocks, we have the name Williams, which is a common slave name for African Americans. You see that same sweep, you really see the same idea with the horses, but the details are really a lot of fun. Look, for example, down at the bottom with Napoleon's boot and the Timberlake that's on um, the, uh, the modern version. The, cloth that he's wrapped around his head. So many of the details are really a lot of fun in this modern version. Well, he's really a great painter. Here's his version of iced tea, his portrait of iced tea on the left. And you'll notice that it is influenced by Angle, the, another uh, painter that we looked at last week, the same pose the same pride, looking sort of askance at us. Now the angle picture has Napoleon looking straight on, look at me, I'm your ruler. Ice-T is saying even more beyond that. I'm not your ruler, but I'm kind of better than you. So this is Wiley again, I think he does terrific stuff. Now we'll look at angle again. You'll remember that he, did the Odalis that we talked about last week. And here on the right is his portrait of the enthroned emperor, once again in his same garb, his scepters looking straight on. And on the left, you see what could have influenced him Jan Van Eck from the Ghent altarpiece in the uh, Renaissance in the 15th century, looking straight on at us with that same oval shaped in the background. He's comparing him to a god. He's doing it once again in this painting, which is, is not of Napoleon, but was an earlier painting that Angla did. You can see the way that the two are related in terms of its composition. This is Thetis who is pleading at the foot of Jupiter, 
who's the big god, the big king of gods, sort of like seducing him. I'm like, she's tickling his beard. She's got her hand on his knee. Her clothes are falling off. But he's standing there stalwart. Well, this positioning is based on an early statue. Look at the size of that statue. By look at the little tiny people down at the bottom of it. We don't actually have that statue, but we do have it reproduced from coins and from the literature that talk, talks about it. Zeus, the equivalent of Jupiter in Greece at Olympia. Look at the god-like progression that we see here between Napoleon and the Roman and Greek gods. Eugène Delacroix was a romantic painter. Now, you can't get much more romantic than his lion hunt. He's also known for really doing wonderful animals. And he also created one of the greatest paintings of the revolutionary period. This is Liberty Leading the People. And here is one of the, as I said, many revolutions. We went back to a king with King Charles X. In, in 1830, there was another revolution to topple the throne. Here we see Lady Liberty, who to the French, they give her the name Marianne. She is the, not the patron saint, that would be Joan of Arc, but she is the symbol for the country, for the Republic. And, you see her trampling the bodies, getting over. It's even said that the character on the right, jumping over the bodies with the pistol, was the inspiration for Victor Hugo, for Gavroche in Les Miserables. So here you see the details of her trampling the bodies, I mean, I talked about bloody revolutions, and there's the boy. Coldplay used this image for their album, Viva La Vida, or Death and All His Friends. And Lily Bernard in 2011, an African-American painter, Cuban, painted the revolution of Carlotta leading her people in this revolt against slavery. Carlotta was later drawn and quartered, put to death, but she's using the same image of Lady Liberty. Here is a picture of storming the town hall, they are storming the barricades. The word barricades is very central to these revolutions because in medieval times, the streets were very narrow and they had created these barricades during the revolutions that the uh, monarchy had to keep the people who were revolting away. But here they're crossing the barricades, look at the dead bodies, look at the Tricolor, the flag of France. This picture, I don't think, needs a lot of comment. This is by Gust a painting by Gustave Kobe, uh, Caibot of his brother, Rene. And this is in the family home. He's looking out at a new Paris, a Paris where after the revolution, all the boulevards were broadened like those broad boulevards, like the Champs-Elysees that come out from the Arc de Triomphe, the Arc, the, uh, Arc of Triomphe in that star shape. And he's looking at this new Paris. These are also by Caibot who was, he died very early. He did an extraordinary painter. He was very wealthy and he was a mentor and a member of the Impressionist 
uh, supporting them at times. His most famous painting is Paris Street on a Rainy Day, where again, the boulevards are being celebrated. Look at the people here. They're almost frozen in place in order to sort of celebrate not just the people being free, but this new Paris. On the right is this new bridge, this crossway that went between the boulevards and the, the railroad station, the Gare Saint-Lazare. And here you see them with a little bit more motion. Look at the steam coming up in back. Two more paintings that celebrate this changing Paris. Manet's The Railway, taken in the same location. You can sort of see through the fence back there a bit of the Gare Saint-Lazare that the, uh, this is going to very much in the Impressionist style, although Manet not always was that Impressionistic. And look at Monet's Gare Saint-Lazare. This is Monet at his best. And he's great with the water, with this impressionistic feeling of the steam, the industrialization that is coming into Paris. Let's look at another Monet. And this is a Liberty Festival. This is not during the revolution. The revolution is long gone, but this is not a Bastille day but it was another Liberty Peace celebration with all of the French flags flying. He is bringing motion in this. He shows the crowds, the jubilation. Vincent van Gogh did the same thing in his own style where he is post-impressionistic and he's really just giving more just a, the impression of these flags flying. He was in Paris, he was part of the impressions post-impressionist group. He didn't get along with them very well and ended up in the south of France, but he was in Paris with the impressionists. And they all gathered around Montmartre. In Paris, there's that, there's that little hill. On top of it is the big white Sacre church. And that is the top, the Mount of Martyrs. And it is, this scene, this very rural scene that Van Gogh painted, it was hard to realize this is, this is our old friend Van, Van Gogh. What are these, what element, man-made element is present in both of these pictures of Momot? There is a mill, a windmill in the left. On the right, there's a blue windmill. And then on wheels, there's an advertisement of a red roofed windmill. Can you guess what that is? Well, that red mill, which is Moulin Rouge in French, you can see down here on the left, it was a big, very popular nightclub. Now we're entering the Belle Epoque, the time of fun and frivolity in Paris. It's really kind of the image that a lot of us still carry of what Paris is all about. Here on the right is an ad. You can go today to the Moulin Rouge and see the Can Can, sort of take a tour of nightclubs by night in Paris. Well, you may know the master of the Moulin Rouge, the master of that Belle Epoque in the painting on the right. In a minute, we're going to see a video about that painting. On the left, it's going to be compared to this painting done during the same period of time by Edgar Degas called The Absinthe Drinker. Notice there's drinking in both of the pictures. What do you also notice about the ways these two pictures are constructed? Look at the setting of the tables and the Degas making that triangle. Look at the balustrade that is going up in the triangle in the Moulin Rouge. 
In both cases, you almost feel as if you're looking at a photograph that you're held back away from what's going on and you're looking at a, a photograph of what's happening. What do you think is happening? Okay, let's look at the video. This is Montmartre in Paris, a place of steep and cobbled streets, a district full of character and charm. It's one of the most popular places in the whole of Paris. And it's here that the French artist Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec made his name. At the end of the 19th century, Montmartre was an exciting place. New technologies and political change were transforming everyday life. The entertainment industry was in full swing, with the opening of numerous cafe concerts, cabarets and theatres. Even windmills were transformed into concert halls. Artists, writers, performers and philosophers came to exchange ideas and break the rules. Toulouse-Lautrec was part of this. He used his posters and paintings not just to challenge what art could do, but also as a visual record of this exuberant era. He was born into a wealthy aristocratic family in southern central France in 1864. Suffering from a genetic condition that stunted his growth and restricted his ability to participate in physical activities, Toulouse-Lautrec directed his energy into painting and drawing, developing a distinct and fluid style. In 1882, he moved to Paris to further his training as an artist, settling in the colourful district of Montmartre. There, he became close friends with radical young artists like Vincent van Gogh and Emile Bernard. Around them, Parisian society was embracing a new, more liberal attitude and Toulouse-Lautrec and his fellow artists immersed themselves in the inspiring vibrancy of Montmartre life. Unlike the Impressionists, who gravitated towards scenes of upper-middle-class leisure, Toulouse-Lautrec preferred to depict the new urban nightlife. He could be found every night drinking and sketching at his favourite venues, the Moulin Rouge, the Chat Noir and the Murleton. The famous faces there became his friends and these recognisable characters populated his work. In the 1890s, technological advances in lithography were being pioneered by a number of Paris-based artists. It was the perfect medium for advertising. Desperate to attract new and larger audiences, the owners of the cabarets and concert halls were commissioning posters from artists such as Pierre Bonnard, Steinlin and Jules Chiray. Toulouse-Lautrec created a poster for the Moulin Rouge. His bold, fresh design made him an overnight success and one of the most sought-after designers. Over the next decade, Toulouse-Lautrec advertised numerous venues, promoting the performers, enhancing their careers and creating a culture of celebrity in Montmartre. But he also painted the quieter, unseen humanity of these different characters. He loved his subjects, lived with them and depicted them without judgment. A sympathy that perhaps came from his own sense of being an outsider due to his physical limitations. You can see his humane, realistic treatment of women who worked and lived in Montmartre in roles that society had traditionally frowned upon, such as sex workers and cabaret performers. He gives an honest depiction of their lives behind the scenes. His subjects are not miserable in the way that Degas had sometimes depicted them, but neither are they happy or idealised. He leaves us with the naturalness of their lives. Even today, Toulouse-Lautrec's enduring legacy is visible in Montmartre. His posters and paintings remain immensely popular, and they continue to influence. Toulouse-Lautrec died in 1901, aged only 36, but his art and the people depicted in his art continue to draw us back to this unique and inspiring part of Paris. So we're going to be looking at the work of Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec, a fun guy, sometimes bolstered by drinking a little bit too much absinthe, which is 
one of the things that led to his death, but he he was kind of a, a trickster. So here he is dressed up like a clown. He is picturing the height of what's called La Belle Epoque, the time of French fun and frivolity. Revolutions are in the past. The streets are broadened. Paris is gay. He is the painter of gay Paris. Here he is, the home that he was raised in Albi. You see his picture as a child, as an adult, and that's kind of his chop. That is his signature down below um, on the right. One thing that you learn about going to Albi to the museum that's created uh, from his works is that he was a prodigy. I mean, they have things even younger than this, but these are two self-portraits done at 18. In the post-impressionistic style on the left, he is sort of a man about town. You can't see that he's only five feet tall and um, is stunted. His, only his legs were shortened. The rest of them was normal. And here he caricatures himself sitting on a chamber pot. Here are some of the women of the brothels that he frequented. The one on the left is a painting. The one on the right is something that Toulouse-Lautrec often did was to use pastel on something that we would be, say would be like cardboard. You can see the cardboard from behind. Masterful pictures. On the left, you see one of his Workers at sex workers at La, at her toilette, Toulouse Lautrec. Then you can see Degas in his distinctive style, which he sort of shows the um, brush marks. Then Picasso doing the same subject in his blue period, and then as I was preparing this presentation, I ran across this ad in Condé Nast Traveler for St. Lucia Spa, whether consciously or not, it is the same interpretation. Here we see differences in style about the same subject. Degas on the left with the ladies who have been working hard as laundresses, one stretching, and then on the right, another one who's taking a break. This one is so interesting in style because the back is, is very roughly done. But I see a little bit of Andrew Ryeth in that shirt and in that hair, a more realistic interpretation. Two different painters, the same subject. So, as we looked at some portraits last week, Toulouse-Lautrec also painted his friends. At the top, you see his painting of Van Gogh, who is also a victim of drinking absinthe, that poisonous green devil drink that so many were addicted to and had problems with. And on the right, the more peaceful scene after he left Paris of the room that he prepared for Gauguin, he wanted him to come down and in Arles in the south of France, they were gonna create an artist colony from the people from Montmartre, didn't work out. Down below, you see a portrait of Suzanne Balladon. We saw her last week and I mentioned that she was what the dancer in one of Renoir's dance scenes. Here, she's tipping the red wine. And I love this, this portrait. In that long history of reclining women, going back to Giorgione and Titian and Manet, we have her interpretation, that super background. It's like Matisse, pattern on pattern, and her smoking, the nonchalance. Love it. 
So he was a small man with a big talent and a very big life. He portrayed that, that life so well in these posters. As I mentioned in the video, you still see them around Paris and we still think of that. It's just pockets. You have to be an urban archeologist to find little nests in Paris that have that, um, that period look, but these posters bring it back to life. Here he is in fact in fiction. On the left, he's dressed as Jean Avril. You saw her in some of her posters. Then you have the movie in 1952, I loved this movie, where uh, Jose Ferrer played um, Toulouse Lautrec on his knees throughout the whole film. Toulouse Lautrec was really one of the stars of the film. He's played down in the 2001 Baz Luhrmann version of Moulin Rouge where Nicole Kidman has a bigger role. John Leguizamo uh, played Toulouse Lautrec. It's now on Broadway and they've actually made a uh, book about the making of it. So in my, one of my shameless personal digressions, I'm going to give a little homage to Henri. When the um, Nicole Kidman Moulin Rouge came out, friends of mine had a, a party to celebrate the Academy Awards as they did every year. The theme was Moulin Rouge. I dressed as Toulouse-Lautrec. I took one of my mother's paintbrushes and put it in a pocket and hung a little French palette of paints on it. And I'm with my dear friend that, who's like my daughter, Gretchen. And then on the right, when I went to the, to Albi, to the museum, I couldn't resist putting my head through one of the posters. Paul Signac was a pointillist. He painted the, the fun and gaiety of Paris. This is a woman, just like we looked at the back of the other women earlier, this is done in a pointillist style. But here's what I would consider his masterpiece. And it probably has, as Gretchen said, when she was proofreading this thing, she said, my God, that's gotta be the longest title of any artwork in the world. This is called Opus 217 against the enamel of a background, rhythmic with beats and angles, tones and tints, portrait of Monsieur Félix Fénéon in 1890. Look at that background. I mean, he, is so ahead of his time. Remember, this is all in points, pointillism. But that kaleidoscope, that fabulous pattern. And I'm just wondering if that is representing the chaos of the Belle Epoque, the time of the dance halls, of the circus, of all of this activity. Well, in this book, and I always cite this book or the twin to it, Mindfulness, every, every session that we have at least once. This is, a, this is a book that has 25 paintings and each one has a reflection on mindfulness by a psychiatrist in Paris, Christophe Andre. And he is saying that Fénéon, who was an art critic, is looking or contemplating the beauty of a cyclamen flower and ignoring the chaos of the Belle Epoque. There's also scholars that say that it's not an accident that the cyclamen has the same name as that cyclical kaleidoscopic work in the background. So, is there a chance that perhaps Signac was telling us about the end of the Belle Epoque, 
the fantasy act but toward the end, the end of the century of the 19th century. There are those that say that this painting, A Bar of the Follies Berger, is typifying that. Now this is one painting I wanted to show a video because it's really great giving the details of this painting that it sort of has that theory. So we're gonna be posting that video on my website and I really recommend it. But what does it show? First of all, it's in a dance hall. It's at the, in their concert halls and a combination of a cabaret. In the background, in the upper left-hand corner, you see two feet hanging down. Well, they're hanging down from a trapeze. So it's a wild scene. In the mirror in back, you see the crowds. In the foreground, you see the champagne and the other things that the people can have. And there's this weird reflection in the mirror where the woman who's looking straight at us is not reflected in her back right back there. She's on the side looking at a man of mystery that some say is Manet, who painted this painting when he was mortally ill and would pass away soon. And look at her expression. Is it that she's just tired from serving people at the Folie Bergère all day? Or is there kind of a wistfulness, maybe a boredom? So it's a really important painting. In uh, last year for Renee Curry's Tackling the Tough Ones, we looked at Proust's In Search of Lost Time in one of the volumes, which is Swan's Way. On the left, you see one of the book covers which shows The Boarding Party by Renoir. And I mentioned that in the front, on the right is Kai Butt, who we looked at earlier. But this is Renoir's whole crowd of people that he knew in Paris. On the right, on the cover, you see Monet's wife that he portrayed. But Proust and Swann were sort of in search of a lost era. And perhaps it was the, the height of the Belle Epoque, which was sort of fading away at the end of the 20th century. Georges Seurat was another pointillist and he portrayed a calmer point of view, but the same subject. Here's our Kankan -kan, done in his pointillist style and it is really a calmer kind of a painter, painting. Like Kai Butts Rainy Day, he kind of freezes these characters. I saw a lot of motion in um, Toulouse-Lautrec's Kankan, -kan, but here they're, they're kind of frozen. Here, in his, again in his style, he is showing the peacefulness of that era with and back, as I pointed out, when we saw Monet's portrait of Monet on his studio boat, you can see the encroachment of industry. But in the foreground, here are these frozen characters that are celebrating a peaceful day at the side of the Seine. But of course, the most famous portrait uh, picture that was done has been come down to us from Seurat is in the Art Institute in Chicago a Sunday afternoon on the island of the Grand Jatte. Here it is. What feelings do you get from this? What details do you see? What communication do you see between the people? What action do you see? Once again, perhaps because pointillism is really a scientific idea of putting dots together so their contrast creates the color. Perhaps that scientific method is sort of taking the emotion out of this. So we again have a very peaceful scene. 
There you see the tiny dots. This is in one section of the painting where shade goes into light on the grass. And you can see all the dots more closely. We think of Chuck Close in that cartoon. I like a picture that when you're up close, doesn't look like much, but you get far away, it looks like something. You may have seen the Broadway production, Sunday in the Park with George, which is all about this painting, creating this painting. And there is a book now called Putting It Together, which is about the creation of that play. Okay, some Syrah silliness. I have a dear friend who's in taking this class who sends me art cartoons that I really appreciate. And I, I love this. Those of us who do selfies and use our cameras, he says, oh, confound it. I thought I was in landscape mode. Or it was in landscape mode, sorry. And then here we have more fun. The office characters posing as the figures in the Ganjat. And on the right, those are Playmobil characters doing the same thing. So this is one of the paintings that's come down to us as many others that I point out as masterpieces that becomes almost a brand, almost a meme. On the left there, you have the Ganjat. On the right, a recent cover of the New York Times Magazine when the pandemic was lightening up and the people could be in Central Park. Here you see them, many of them are sort of social, socially uh, distanced. We see them in port profile, reminding us of the Ganjat. And it also is a, an introduction to our next country. Ours, the United States. You see that I selfishly chose two countries that I know a little bit about the history. I'm not a history buff. So I chose France and the USA. Our national anthem is not bloody. It is really, talking about the concept of our country, the belief that we've held. I know certainly having been born when I was right at the beginning of, of World War II, going through the 50s and the 60s, we have a concept, a vision of ourself of, as to what we're all about. So, what we salute is the flag that still waves over the land of the free and the home of the brave. Let's see how pictures have sort of reflected that throughout the years. The first artist is still alive here. He's been given the Presidential Medal of Freedom by Barack Obama. And one of the things that he specialized in was pictures of our flag. On the left, you see a triple one that is a painting. It's not pieces of wood on each other, but it's just a painting. The one on the right where the flag is uh, covered with pictures of the United States flag, the United States map. Now, He's reflecting another aspect of our country in 1969. They're all entitled flag. This is entitled flag moratorium. What do you see sort of in the background, the green part here? Yes, it's to show camouflage. In the back, the color is slightly orange for Agent Orange. Jasper Johns is, was commissioned to commemorate the anti-war, the moratorium marches against the Vietnam War in 1969. In the middle of this picture, 
and you'll have to do it at your leisure. If you stare at that perhaps bullet hole in the middle for 60 seconds, turn away and look at a plain white wall, you'll see the colors of our flag. I did it, it works. So what kind of parts of our history do we show in our national capital? What is it that we're proud of? Is it like Lady Liberty from a revolution? What do we see here? We've all seen this rotunda. We've seen it during the times when dignitaries who passed away lie in state. And we see those giant pictures in the background. Ever wondered what they are? Well, we have the landing of Columbus. We have kind of ironically for the history of our country, we have the baptism of Pocahontas so that she could marry John Rolfe. And let's look at another painting that we have. This is a surrender of Cornwallis at Yorktown. And this is the end of the Revolutionary War with Great Britain. You don't see General Washington here. You don't see Cornwallis. What you see is a soldier who's coming by horse and he is receiving the sword from a British soldier as a sign of surrender. On the left, you see French soldiers lined up. And they are there because they helped end the war. They blocked the British fleet from coming in. And ironically, at this time, Louis XVI was the King of France. He's the one who will be beheaded in that revolution began in 1789. On the right, we have the Americans lined up, including uh, Washington, who's not prominent, but he's on the brown horse. We have here another picture that I think is more, is best held without my commentary. What we see here is the surrender of Cornwallis, the same painting on January 6, 2021 images of ourselves through pictures. There was a time I've heard when people wanted to replace our difficult to sing national anthem with America the Beautiful, not celebrating so much the idea of our country, although it does talk about our brotherhood, but celebrating our beauty our natural beauty. This was done in the Hudson River School. These are some of the early paintings that were done to show the majesty of that country that is so new, so unconquered, that what people really thought of in America to paint and the impression that others got of us, of our country, was of her magnificent scenery, her landscape. Let's look at a video about this painting commonly called the Oxbow. We're in the Metropolitan Museum of Art looking at Thomas Cole's view from Mount Holyoke, of Northampton, Massachusetts after a thunderstorm, the Oxbow. Right, but we know it as the Oxbow. It's a Hudson River School painting by Thomas Cole, who's credited with founding American landscape painting. Landscape painting was ranked very low by the academies in Europe. Though. And painting was ranked very low in American society. <laughs> That's true. And when Americans didn't want paintings, they didn't want grand mythological scenes. They wanted portraits or landscapes or views like this one. And this is a view of a well-known, unusual natural scene, a place where the Connecticut River bends back on itself. This is 
a really large painting. I think it's five or six feet wide and five feet high. And that speaks to the importance that Thomas Cole wanted to give to landscape painting. Landscape painting considered this lowly genre, but here made not only large in size, but Cole, even here in this view, trying to say something more with landscape. When we think of Thomas Cole, we think of the course of empire or the voyage of life, these moments when he tries to use landscape to say something big, but something big is hidden here too. This is really ambitious. And it's not just landscape. It's about transformation. It's about time. It's about a kind of metamorphosis. Well, it's about America and what America is going to become. So on the left side, we see a storm-ravaged landscape. We see a broken tree. We see rain pouring down, birds that seem to be frantic as they fly through the sky. And we can even make out a little bit of a lightning bolt at the extreme left. So we have what art historians and art critics at the time even referred to as the sublime, an image of nature that is wild and untamed and frightening and awesome. This untouched wilderness, this virgin forest was seen in stark contrast to the built environment of old Europe. And so here was a promise of the new. It was America as a new Eden. And this is so different than what Cole gives us on the other side, which is Americans settling this virgin landscape, transforming it into cultivated plots of land, into areas to graze their livestock, into places to settle and build homes. And the storm is passing, the sun is coming, and there's a sense that this settling of the land is something which is ordained by God, which is approved by God. And this is really tied in with the American notion of manifest destiny, that Americans were meant to tame this landscape, that this was ours. And in fact, at least one art historian has looked at the hill in the center of the painting and read in that Hebrew letters when looked at from above and in reverse from God's viewpoint, they seem to read from the Hebrew the word Shaddai, which means almighty, referring to God. So that idea that this is God's plan and God has blessed America. Now in art historical terms, what this is, is the transition from the sublime to the pastoral. The pastoral being a peaceful idea of landscape, of man inhabiting landscape with a sense of tranquility and peacefulness. And we can see that in all of these anecdotal vignettes that Cole gives us. If you look at the lower right corner of the painting, for instance, you can see a ferry that's been carefully rendered. You can see people that have been let off at one side and people who are now crossing over to the other. And a pathway that goes down to some farmland and places where sheep are grazing and our eye can travel up and back through the chimney stacks of a few houses here and there, up through a valley where the sun is shining shining between two hills and up to those bright clouds and the sunshine and that sense of promise. There's also a wonderful specificity that I think is very much meant to entertain and to represent the particularity of nature. If you look at the left side, you can see there's fungus that's growing out of the blasted tree trunk. You can just make out a bird on one of the blasted boughs. But probably the most fun is at the bottom center of the canvas, the artist himself looking back at us. And next to him, just slightly up the hill, is his supplies, his umbrella that will shelter him, a portfolio, a chair. But that chair is also a cross. And so we understand not only the passage of time here, the transition from wilderness to a paradise that man is creating, but we also understand this all within a Christian context. His portfolio, which has his name on it, reads as the signature of this painting also reads as a tombstone for the artist. So there is that sense of the passage of time. But I want to go back to a word that you used a moment ago, and that was entertain. Because here we are, first half of the 19th century, there's a middle class audience and a new rising merchant class from which Cole is drawing his patrons. But there is this real need to entertain, to exhibit these paintings and make them fun for people to look at. This is not complicated. It's not mythology. No, it's something that everyday Americans could relate to and really fall in love with. So here is a, another view of the landscape by Thomas Cole. The landscape, of course, is what you see first. 
And then these tiny little figures down there. This is an illustration for the last of the Mohicans showing the sacrifice of Korah. So it's the nature that prevails. Another very successful member of the Hudson River School was the German American Albert Bierstadt. Here, we're coming west now, we see a storm in the Rocky Mountains. Look at the drama. Remember our picture of Napoleon crossing the Alps, the, look at the dramatic sky. And the thing that I noticed about this sky and this landscape is that the hills, the mountains back there in sunshine are echoed in the clouds up above. And that we have a period, a place of darkness and coming into the light. But in the overall painting, it is once again, the majesty of the nature that we think of. On the left, we have one that is in the Monterey Museum of Art, Lake Tahoe. It's dramatic in a different way, where we have the sun, the lighting on the sky, and not on sort of the mysterious lake. And on the right, something that many of you probably have seen in person, Half Dome in Yosemite Valley, which brings us to a sort of local. This is Ansel Adams who was instrumental along with other really famous photographers of starting the photograph the Center for Photography, Photographic Art in Monterey. And he has dramatized Half Dome in these two pictures. Now some think that it's a, it's a sin to tamper with a photograph. I mean, for heaven's sake, it's an art. And he is manipulating the light here, the moon up above to give us the most dramatic effect. We talked about doing something for the effect of lamentation when we looked at the death of the Marah. Here we're looking at the beauty of Yosemite by Ansel Adams. Here are two pictures of waving flags. I don't think it's too hard to figure out which one was done by Monet and which one was done by our great, one of our great impressionists. So we have Monet's flying flags of celebration on the left and on the right, we have some that are down the avenue in New York. And this is Child Hassan. And he was very successful as an impressionistic painter in the United States. Here is his flags flying, both the French, the American and the United Kingdom. We have Italy across the street. The flags flying up 34th Street, the great Crosstown Avenue in New York. And then cat boats, impressionist, peaceful, new views of a populated, country. And here in Maine, we hearken back to Monet, who had showed us a field of poppies. We have these beautiful gardens with the bay beyond. Now, this is not by Chal Hassan, but it's by another American Impressionist. Some of you may know this painting. Do you know where it's done? Do you know who the artist is? Here we see we're sort of up on a hill picking apples. We see the beautiful curve of the bay beyond. We see the houses that sort of look like child's toys, the way they're put together sort of geometrically. This is what Cezanne taught the Impressionists to do that was picked up later by the Cubist. This Impressionist is using this method here. 
That setting is Monterey, California. You'll notice the picture on the left. You see the wharf. This is taken from the point of view of the Presidio near the Military Museum, where you often see newscasters in our local news with the wharf beyond. That's where this painting was done. On the right, even more so, the artist has that little blocking, that geometric blocking of her village of Monterey. Mount Toro in the background. I live on the other side of Mount Toro, so I see Mount Toro from the opposite side. And that painter is Charlton Fortune. She, her first name is Euphemia. She did not want to be taken as a woman because she wanted to be taken seriously as an artist. You see her here in a portrait. It's a little bit hazy. Sadly, um, she had a, what, a cleft palate and did not like to be seen or shown in sharp photographs. This is something that kind of like haunted her throughout her life. She had a studio in Monterey, sort of near the um, Custom House Plaza. And toward the end of her life, you see her in the studio here, see the little stained glass renderings down here. She started doing religious decorations for Catholic churches. She did brass, she did tapestries, incredible, incredible artist. She's buried at San Carlos Cemetery. And here is a painting I'm totally in love with. Some of you may have gone to the tour, the Ollie tour of the Trotter Gallery, where Terry Trotter showed you around his wonderful collection. The first time I went, the only time that I went there, I said, oh my God, you've got St. Ives. He had, he had a little piece of, of this one. This was, is not in Monterey. She would frequently go to England to paint. This is in Monterey Museum of Art. But this is a painting with sound. I can hear that swirling cyclone of gulls up there like I can when I'm down in Monterey near the wharfs. I can hear the fishermen shouting about their catch as they're bringing it up to the people who come down to buy it. It's, I, I just in love with this painting. Now we're gonna talk about an entirely different point of view of our country. Here we have the cartoon that started the name for the Ashcan School. Because critics said, you know, you're, you're painting kind of a seamy side of life. So that they took this George Bellows cartoon and sort of made this name because they've taken some food out of the trash can, which they called an ash can. And this guy is looking down on it and the caption says, there's worms in it. In other words, there's worms in the, in the food. On the right, you see some of the members of the Ashcan School from John Sloan's studio. The painter that we're gonna look at today is George Lukes from that Ashcan School, and we'll learn a little bit about what he did and what the Ashcan School did in a video. We're in the Brooklyn Museum looking at a painting by George Lukes called Street Scene Hester Street. It was painted in 1905 when Hester Street was absolutely packed with new immigrants, and that's what we're seeing here. Hester Street was the symbolic and commercial center of the Jewish Lower East Side. Here, Lukes has chosen to depict a market scene. We see two groups of men who are gesticulating and conversing with one another. In the center of the composition, a toy peddler who's demonstrating a toy and his wares to a group of children and to other adults who surround him. There are other shoppers included, one of whom is a woman who's wearing a red shawl, carrying a basket. She's hastening towards the left-hand portion of the composition as two other men appear to be moving towards the right. But even though we understand that that woman 
one is moving past. The way that Luke's has structured the painting, they are confronting each other. And it does, to me, refer to the way that cities bring people together in unexpected ways. As we continue to move to the right, across this frieze of figures that are so close to us in the foreground, we can look into a shop doorway, we see a man there, and then to their right, a woman who is holding a dead plucked chicken and seems to have perhaps just purchased it from the store behind her. In the right-hand portion of the composition, Luke's has also placed a push cart. And then in the very lower right corner, we can see the edge of a basket. And there's also this very palpable sense of congestion. The sky is visible only in a small blue strip at the very top portion of the composition. And the tenements, the actual buildings and structures that make up this urban environment, have a sort of oppressive quality to them. And it's impossible to overstate the sheer human density in the Lower East Side at this time. And there were more than 700 inhabitants per acre by 1905. Between 1880 and 1920, more than 20 million immigrants came to America. This was the greatest period of mass migration in American history. And by 1905, the Lower East Side was home to approximately 500,000 Jewish immigrants, most of whom had recently arrived from Eastern and Southern Europe. And they came because of economic reasons, but also because of political violence, particularly in the wake of the assassination of the Tsar in Russia. A series of pogroms were inflicted on Jews, that is, violent attacks on Jewish towns in what was called the Pale, that is, areas in Poland and the eastern edge of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. And I think it's important to account for the fact that Jewish immigrants came not only voluntarily, but as refugees fleeing the state-sanctioned violence. With the increased arrival of Jewish immigrants to the United States, also came this rising nativist sentiment, anti-Semitism that became pervasive in American life and culture during this era. And I think it's impossible to consider Luke's painting without taking into account histories of race and immigration during this period. We do know that Luke's created a number of anti-Semitic caricatures for several publications during the 1890s that preceded his work on this painting. And like many other writers and artists of this era, he ventured into the Lower East Side with this kind of fixation with the Jewish Lower East Side, with immigrants and the neighborhoods that they occupied. And if you look, for instance, at the physiognomies that are being depicted here, Luke's is clearly carrying on this anti-Semitic tradition that had been so common in the press in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. What we know is that Luke's talked about hunting types in the Lower East Side. This was a moment when there was fascination with the Lower East Side in more established and genteel parts of, of Manhattan. People would, just like Luke's, come and visit on market days to see the hubbub, to see the activity, to see these exotic foreigners. And this type of unidealized subject matter was what was considered most revolutionary about the Ashkent School. The fact that they were not looking to genteel subject matter or genteel areas of the city, but it is important to think about the unequal power dynamics that are really implicit in these kinds of paintings. It's something that's not readily apparent, but Luke's ventured into these areas with this express purpose in mind. I think it's interesting while we still have a vision of that painting in our heads, if we sort of close our eyes and remember the rainy day in Paris and remember the, the island of Grand Jatte, and imagine picturing our kind of society in that same way. Here we have just the congestion and the thing that is sort of characterizing our country. Well, one painter that uh, we've talked about, that was his studio, John Sloan of the uh, Ashcan School, did this very famous McSorley's Bar. Here we have a New York bar where the people are just looking like everyday people. Look at the painting on the right. This is by our mystery artist today. One of our participants ran into this mystery artist at an exhibition in Florida. I didn't know this person was even a painter. And I'm likening this picture, one too many, to the John Sloan where you have nitty gritty, where you have this bar scene, 
typical of what now we're the kind of image we're showing of the United States that's going out to the world. On the left, we have George Bellows of the Ashcan School, stag at Sharkey's, where it was a stag night and all the men are there to watch the boxing, that wonderful portrayal of the human body. We think back to Michelangelo's ability to show the human body, the action, the feeling, the nitty grittiness of that night. Now I'm giving you a hint as to the full name of our mystery artist on the right, who also showed the uh, showed boxing. And that painter with his self-portrait at the top in the middle is Bob Dylan. Now, either fortunately or unfortunately, Renee Curry, who signed up for this class, is not here today. But so I can freely say that she was visibly upset the day we were in class and Bob Dylan received the Nobel Prize for literature. But I didn't know that he was also a painter. I'd like to thank our participant, Bruce, for having discovered this painting for me and for our class today. All right, John Stuart Curry. He's part of the many painters who concentrated on the Middle West. This is another image that we have of ourselves, that stolid Middle West, the, the uh, Kansas, the Iowa, the, the, the salt of the earth kind of people. Here we see a baptism in Kansas, in tornado, like in Wizard of Oz, a tornado over Kansas. Now we're in the depression. This is 1928 and 1929. These are like genre painters, paintings showing the everyday life, not in a nitty gritty way of the Ashcan school, but in a more illustrative way, showing the life of the middle part of our country. Here's an important painting for the history of the United States. This, this painting is in the Kansas State Capitol building. That figure in the front is John Brown. This is a period in Kansas that's called the bloody or bleeding. Kansas. John Brown here is holding what's called a gun, which they call Beecher's Bible, which is a way of preventing through force going into slavery. He has a Bible on the right, Alpha and Omega of an apocalypse. He shows the soldiers of the Union on the left and of the Confederates on the right. He shows the flames burning the old Kansas on the right, the tornado coming on the left. This was painted in 1940. This is talking about something that was happening in the 1850s before the Civil War. He's painting the prelude to the Civil War, the warnings of what could happen. He also has a mural in our Department of Justice, which has been in the news lately. You can see the mural there at the top, which is having a reference to a lynching. You see the people who've lynched the um, person who is at the foot of the judge on the right. And the judge is saying, get out of here. We do real justice. We don't do lynching justice here. Thomas Hart Benton, 
was perhaps one of the greatest portrayers of the Roaring Twenties of America that was going out to the world as, well, maybe we call it our belle époque. Here we show this tremendous mural that was in a boardroom in New York, and it is now at the Metropolitan Museum, where in each one of these panels, you can see the architecture in the one that we have in the front. We see the dancing, probably the Lindy or the Charleston. We see the flying diver up there, the um, people at the bar. We see a family scene in the front. All of these from industry to all the different aspects of America today be portrayed in this mural. This is another painting that I showed in the class that we did on American art. Look at the details on the left. Here again, we have the boxing. We have the guy that's looking at a book here and the different characters. Look at the people doing the shimmy, a little bit of uh, fun and frivolity up there and the contrast with industry in all of its aspects. America getting to know be, be known as a technological center. Now this painting is new to me. It's called Sugar Shack. I wonder if any of you know this painting. It is not by Thomas Hart Benton, but it is so much like Thomas Hart Benton. I learned about it yesterday when the news was on and they talked, they were showing all these pictures done by this artist. And I thought, oh my gosh, they have something on Thomas Hart Benton. He has these kind of like elongated swirly people, sort of like El Greco's paintings, but it's not Thomas Hart Benton. It is Ernie Barnes. And the reason that it was in the news is that on May 14th, his Sugar Shack painting sold for 15 million at a New York auction. Unfortunately, he had passed away. On the right, you see a painting that he did, a still life with football memorabilia. He had been a football star or football player and um, went into painting. I love this one. Once again, I can feel the music. I can feel this gospel rhythm. And I can see that rhythm in the pulse that's going between these characters. It's just a wonderful interpretation by a Black American of a Black American society. Dorothea Lang was the chronicler of the depression. You see her on top of her car over here. She was commissioned by the United States government to go out and photograph what she saw in the West primarily of the depression. The iconic image of the depression is one that she thought shot of the woman who looks, according to the photograph, destitute, and has three children there that are hiding. As a contrast, I think it's fun to look at them later on in life. There she is in her lawn chair with her three children grown up. So hope. On the left, we have her Crossroads store in North Carolina, where she's documenting the African-American, the former slaves in, or, or, her, or sons of former slaves, probably, or grandsons in this storefront. On the right, Gordon Parks did a photograph of a storefront, African-Americans on the, the front of this, 
he documented in the 50s, the life of African Americans in the United States. There's not a lot of difference. Here we see on the left, an ex-tenant farmer on relief. Looks as if he's like me, taken into custody, but I think they're just the three of them are standing there. That's by Dorothea Lang. And on the right, her drawing of called In the Crowd, again with one of the many images that came out of the Great Depression. I don't think most of you, I know some of you may have had parents who were part of the Great Depression. My, my parents were married in 1932. So the stamp of that period of life was very visible in them throughout their lives, the memory of it. This is just to me, one of her best. It's a billboard on Highway 99 in California. World's highest standard of living. There's no way like the American way. Close your eyes and think of the images that I just showed that she, she was documenting in our country. So she was telling the story of the depression. The storyteller, and once again, I've, I've shown Norman Rockwell before and feel that I have to defend showing it. But he was an illustrator, usually for the cover of the Saturday Evening Post. And I suppose there are some purists that say an illustration can't be a masterpiece and I would tend to disagree. I'd say it's art. I know I went through life with my father as a cartoonist, animator saying, well, he's not really an artist. He just does cartoons and animation. I don't believe that now. I believe that was art. But here we call him America's storyteller with this little gossiping of the story going through the people that he did. He also showed us a mirror of what we believed about ourselves in the 50s and 60s. He showed us a picture of our freedoms, our freedom from want with this idyllic Thanksgiving setting. Freedom from fear, putting the two children safely to sleep at night. Freedom of speech, the man standing up in the town hall, and of worship. Notice the older woman in the front and her hands. My mother, who's an artist, told me that hands are the hardest thing to get right. And I said last week when I showed you that self-portrait of Albrecht Durer, to look at the hands below, I'm showing you Durer's Prairie in Hands. It's probably the most famous uh, artwork that Durer ever did. Rosie the Riveter. Now, there is a magnificent video of Rosie the Riveter, and I didn't think that I would have time to show it but it's going to be one that I'm going to put on my website along with the Folie Vergere. I really recommend it because they get into a lot of the detail here. But Rosie the Riveter started as a song. It was a song in 1942 where they were talking about the um, strength of the women who were taking the men's jobs who were actually doing the job that men couldn't do because they were going off to war. Look at her with almost like a rifle sitting on her, her lap. That's her riveter. That's what she's using to do the rivets. Look at her lunchbox back there with her name on it. And instead of jewelry, she has this series of pins. One of them is a Red Cross pins. These are uh, pro war on the home front pins. She is proud looking and she's nonchalant. I mean, she's eating a sandwich. And what, what you can't see here is that 
in her pocket. It's hard because it's white on white, but in her pocket that we see on the left side of the picture, she has her compact and she has fresh makeup on. So she's still very feminine. So if you have a chance to see that, notice her foot wearing loafers and these great socks. It is stomping on a copy of, can you see it? Mein Kampf, which is Hitler's manifesto. So the symbolism here of Rosie the Riveter is that she is helping to stamp out the enemy. There is a snake down in the, in the hose that's going from the Riveter. And she is part of the idea of snakes that will smite the man down, another symbolism. This is framed because it's in the Crystal Bridges Museum in Arkansas that was created by one of the Walton heirs, the Museum of American Art. They show Norman Rockwell, as does George Lucas in his narrative museum that he's building in Los Angeles where they're showing art that tells stories, including Rockwell and animation and things we consider as just illustration. Well, today we have the new symbol of Rosie the Riveter in the We Can Do It poster by J. Howard Miller. And on the right, I'm showing you the woman named Betty Reed Soskin, who worked at the Rosie the River Museum, which is a national park in Richmond, California, where they show lots of different aspects of the home front during the war, which I remember so well. I was three when the war started. I was eight when the war ended. So that these things like buying war bonds and using uh, stamps to buy rationing stamps, all of this was very much taken for granted. She just retired at the age of 100 from her national park duties. So was Rockwell telling all of America's stories? Look at the lunch counter up above where we see this sweet little date, I guess kids coming back from perhaps a school dance or the prom sitting sitting pretty at a lunch counter and that guy we called it soda jerk, soda jerk in the background. And here we see on the right, the, this, the policeman who has brought the boy who was playing to it, uh, truant to the lunch counter. Is he ignoring the fact that at that same period of time, they started in February of 1960, sit-ins at lunch counters so that African-Americans could join the fun. No, Norman Rockwell did not ignore what was going on. He painted this scene on the right called The Problem We All Live With. And it's part talking about Ruby Bridges, who was integrating a school in New Orleans, escorted by federal marshals. Look at his painting that shows splattered tomatoes in the background and the gorgeous figure in profile that he put uh, Ruby Bridges in. It's, uh, it's a very moving painting. And gris for the mill that illustrators can be make masterpieces. Have you heard of Grandma Roses? Maybe some of you haven't, but certainly in the 50s and 60s, people knew of her paintings. She started painting when she was uh, 78. She lived till 100, uh, 101, it might be just 100, but she died in her 101st year. She painted idyllic scenes of what she called old timey New England, here in snow, here where you have this, the horses, and they're still used on greeting cards. Another image that we send out, think of Ashcan School, 
Think of the Hudson River School. Think of all these ways that we've sent out the image of culture, of the life in the United States. It's what we've internalized as a picture of us, if we've been exposed to this. It's what, the way that other countries see us. Well, contrast, another way that our society is pictured. This is pop art. Let's look at the video. Pop art was an artistic movement that emerged in the 1950s in Great Britain and the United States. In Britain, a group of young artists and critics who called themselves the independent group started having meetings in the Institute of Contemporary Art in London around 1952 to 1953. With members like Richard Hamilton and Eduardo Pelosi, the independent group got together to discuss some of the pressing issues they saw in contemporary art. The gallery-based idea of art was elitist for them, as it didn't reflect the real lives and needs of people, nor was it available to them. In 1955, the independent group discussed mass culture, film, advertisements, comic books, sci-fi, celebrities, and pop music. They started making collages using elements from everyday life like found objects, magazine cutouts, comic book characters, ads, and product labels. Of course, this didn't go over too well with critics. Mass culture was not only considered kitsch and consumerist, it was also very American. Unsurprisingly, the most dynamic developments in the pop art movement came from the United States. Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns were among the first artists to oppose the dominant trends of abstract expressionism. Rauschenberg drew inspiration from the Dadaism movement, and he believed that art needed to be closely tied to real life. Rauschenberg used discarded ready-made objects in his works before silkscreen printing made it easier to transfer photographs onto his paintings. Jasper Johns was most notable for his depictions of the American flag. In the 1950s, both Johns and Rauschenberg were called neo-dadaists. In 1962, however, the term pop art was coined to describe the use of bold colors, repetitions, and mass media references from comics and magazines to Hollywood stars and popular food and beverage commercials. Roy Lichtenstein is one of the most notable figures in 1960s American pop art. His work owes the most to popular American comic books like Batman and Spider-Man. Using thick black lines, primary colors, Ben Day dots, and ironic speech bubbles in onomatopoeia. Although they represented mass printed media, most of Lichtenstein's best known works were in fact meticulously painted oils on canvas. Seems hard, doesn't it? We can only assume Andy Warhol thought so too, because around 1962, he started using screen printing in his works. The printmaking technique allowed Warhol to craft numerous iterations of the same photographic image on paper or on canvas. This brought us some of the most iconic images of the pop art movement. Warhol was obsessed with the celebrity world. For him, images of popular actors, singers, and even politicians were an essential part of American life, just like the household brands Coca-Cola and, you guessed it, Campbell's Soup. Let's look at Andy Warhol in this self-portrait up here. Remember, we talked about still life and we talked about it last week the memento mori of the skull saying we all should die. Um, right now, streaming on Netflix, there are the Andy Warhol diaries. It's all in his own words. Actually, they sort of like simulated his voice talking about his whole life. He invented himself. He believed that art was a business and he was very successful at it. He had many different iterations. Let's look at a couple. Here is how he portrayed Jacqueline Kennedy, her portrait on the left and on the right in the, he loved the repetition, these multiples, it's called Nine Jackies, showing her at a happier time and at the assassination and the 
uh, funeral. Monroe. Many, many iterations of Monroe. I said last week that uh, one of his paintings of Monroe called The Shot Marion of Maryland sold for 195 million. And on the left, you see that. You see a little spot between her eyebrows. There was a woman who came into the factory and this was not the shooting of Andy Warhol. She was kind of a performer. The factory was the name that Andy Warhol gave his studio where he had all these people helping him. And part of the studio for the, the pop scene in New York. And she shot into the Maryland uh, photo uh, paintings. So there's a little spot there between her eyes. That's why it's called the shot Maryland. He has a series called Death and Disasters. Something that in his feeling, he was fascinated by. He expected others Americans who are, uh, these are hard to look at, but riots and automobile accidents, a whole series of them. Some of his work was pornographic, um, what might be considered pornographic. I wouldn't show it here, but the variety of what he did was incredible. Great, great artist coming from illustration. He had an anti-Nixon series, a cowboy and Indian series. That's Geronimo there. He thought of people or he was expressing the idea that people are, the celebrities are commodities in the same way that a brand becomes a commodity, the logo. People become brands. The people themselves become invisible. And it's the brand that we see. So many of them couldn't live with this dichotomy and had early deaths. Here is Liechtenstein with his standing in front of Wham, that you saw in the video. He talked about some of the attitudes of men and women. Here an attitude of a woman who would rather drown than call for help from probably an alienated boyfriend. In Wham, I pressed the fire control and ahead of me, rockets blazed through the sky, like the rockets red glare, which somebody in the chat pointed out was uh, for our national flag during the uh, battle at Fort Henry. Completely neglected you to say that there was death also that was happening in shooting down. And he was actually um, commissioned to do this as another anti war painting. Kleist Oldenburg, born in 1929, so he's still alive. I don't know if he's still working. I love dropped cone. He did these huge pictures, these huge sculptures of things that we usually look at in a tiny way. You can see it on the building in Cologne. On the left, you see the giant safety pin that's at the de Young Museum in San Francisco. And on the right, the landing hats that are on the Rodeo grounds in Salinas, where you can throw the, so the, the cowboy throws the hat and it just lands in these three different positions. You can glimpse it when you drive by the Rodeo grounds. Faith Ringgold, I also talked quite a bit about in a former class where you can look at it. We'll go over the slides about her very rapidly because we're running out of time. But she has a show at the De Young starting July 16th through November 27th. She's still on, she's still working. There, we are going to be posting on the uh, my website terrific 
video where she's talking about this exhibit. It was at the New School in, um, in New York and it's coming to the De Young in July. So let's go through some of her work rather rapidly. Bleeding flag, her comment on the African-American position in the United States, her feeling about her role and how she sees it. Tar Beach, which uh, you can look at this later, the explanation of it, but there's on the rooftop of their tenement house, on that tar paper rooftop, looking up to the sky, wanting to escape their, their life in New York. Made into a book for children called Tar Beach. There she is escaping to the New York skyline. And this powerful, incredible, magnificent masterpiece showing the fight between the blacks and the whites, the children huddled together underneath, not understanding what's going on, the blood, the knife, innocent people with beliefs that are so contrasting that they're killing each other. And I went right to Picasso's Guernica where innocent people were killed in the bombing of the north, the town in the northern part of Spain by German bombs. You see the screaming women you can see the broken sword, and the little flower down in the middle bottom, a little sign of hope, the lamenting that we saw in the Caravaggio, innocent people being bombed. And of course, then I go to nightly news and I think of these two paintings as I look at the pictures in Ukraine. Jacob Lawrence documented the, Af the African American experience migrating from the South to a life in the North. But then in 1975, he did this homage to the confrontation on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, where the Blacks are coming across the bridge and are not allowed to cross by the federal marshals which here are signified by the open mouth of a wolf. This brought me back to another Rene Courage class that we had this year on the Invisible Man. I talked about invisible celebrities because you don't see the people behind the mask. And that's the point that we have here of the blacks and the whites. The final painter did, does landscapes. Do you recognize the setting? They look like photographs. It's just photorealism. Do you know where they're painted? Do you know who the painter is? Well, that painting was where I took a photograph the other day from my house, the other side of Mount Toro. That is not Mount Toro, but this is my backyard. That is the foothills of the San Lucia Range in Monterey County. It's really fabulous to live in a place that is masterpiece worthy. So we just had the Carmel Art Festival. Artists come from all over to paint our area, our part of America, that is showing what we know now. That painter is David Lagar. He is sort of the, well, I think he's the master of the painters that, that I'm familiar with. He takes our setting and superimposes neoclassical images, making them supernatural something that two realistic things put together make them beyond realism. 
And that gets us to the preview of coming attractions. This is the last painting we'll show. This is David Lagarde showing the surrealistic view, the flame coming up from a bouquet of flowers in a niche that's set with the background of our own Monterey Bay. <laughs> 